This is the tale of how my family disintegrated, and my name is Kimberly. It all began when my younger brother, Tommy, was five and I was seven years old. Mom had taken Tommy to his first actual piano lesson, and I can still clearly recall the day. She was virtually floating on air when they returned. Kim, come here, she said, her voice full of enthusiasm. Wondering what all the commotion was about, I rushed down the stairs. Your brother is a genius in music. Although I wasn't really sure what that signified, I could tell it was significant. That's fantastic, I answered, attempting to seem excited. With gleaming eyes, Mom said, the teacher says he has perfect pitch. Are you aware of how uncommon that is? I have no doubt that he will become a star. It was all about Tommy after that day. In order to concentrate on his profession, Mom abandoned her part-time employment. She would spend hours looking into kid-friendly talent events and music competitions. Our living room became a miniature recording studio, furnished with a microphone, keyboard, and even a tiny karaoke machine. Do not misunderstand, Tommy was good. His voice was clean and pure, like that of a tiny angel when he sang. However, I couldn't help but feel excluded. Mom was too preoccupied with Tommy's possible celebrity status and Dad. Dad wasn't really there. He would go to work before I was up and return home after I had gone to bed. He was too tired to do much else on the weekends, so he would watch TV or tinker in the garage. I therefore learned how to look after myself. I would prepare my own meals, do my assignments without being questioned, and make an effort to keep my troubles to myself. But it wasn't all awful. I had my grandmother, my books, and a few close pals. Mom's mother was grandma, but they couldn't have been more unlike. Grandma was grounded and pragmatic, but Mom was all about the limelight and celebrity. When I was 12, I began helping out at her little convenience shop in town after school. She would smile at me over her spectacles and remark, Kimberly, you're a good worker. Astute financial management will benefit you throughout your life. I valued those remarks more than all the ambiguous compliments I received at home. At least someone recognized me as more than simply Tommy's sister. In relation to Tommy, he was flourishing while being cared for by mom. He had already won a couple local singing contests by the time he was seven years old. Mom's face would light up with joy when she brought his awards and accolades home. Without waiting for a response, she would ask me, Did you see Tommy on TV last night? He was the most gifted child the judges had seen in years, they remarked. I tried to be pleased for my brother by smiling and nodding, but when I saw how differently we were treated, I couldn't help but feel jealous. While I had to save my money for months in order to purchase whatever I wanted, Tommy had access to the newest toys and technology. The gap between Tommy and me widened even further once I started high school. Mom put Tommy in an exclusive private school renowned for its music department, while I went to the neighborhood public school. Taking care of his outfit and reminding him about his voice lessons after school, she would drop him off every morning in our rickety minivan. In the meanwhile, I would have already boarded the early bus and would be halfway to school. When I returned home one day from an especially demanding day of studies and a shift at Grandma's store, Mom and Tommy were seated at the kitchen table, surrounded by flyers and brochures. What is all of this? I put my backpack down beside the door and asked. Mom's eyes gleamed with anticipation as she glanced up. You won't believe it, Kim. Tommy received a call to try out for the National Youth Corps. New York is where the audition is held. We'll have to reserve a hotel, airfare, and new clothes. The question that kept coming to me was, can we afford all that? Mom's smile wavered briefly. We'll get by. We must take advantage of this once-in-a-lifetime chance for Tommy. Knowing better than to argue, I nodded. 
However, I couldn't help but think as I made my way to my room. What about my opportunities? In a sense, I felt proud of Tommy rather than envious of his skill. However, I had had enough of being treated like an outsider in my own family. I overheard mom and dad fighting in their bedroom that evening. I could tell it was about money, even though their voices were muted. Dad was saying, Linda, we're already in debt. We cannot continue to spend in this manner. However, mom felt that this may be Tommy's big break. You don't want him to be successful. Dad groaned, I do, of course, but what about Kim? Nothing has been set aside for her education fund. After a moment, mom's now softer voice said, Kim is smart. She'll get scholarships. In addition, she has always been self-sufficient. She will find a solution. Their remarks reverberated in my mind as I laid in bed and stared at the ceiling. She will find a solution. It always came down to that, didn't it? They threw everything into Tommy's future, leaving me to fend for myself. The next day, I went to work at Grandma's store. As I was restocking shells, Grandma called me over to the counter. Kimberly, she said, her voice gentle, is everything all right? You seem distracted today. I hesitated for a moment. Then the whole story came spilling out. Tommy's audition, the money problems, my fears about college. Grandma listened patiently, her face growing more concerned with each word. When I finished, she shook her head. Listen, I've been thinking. You're a hard worker, Kimberly. How would you like to start earning a real wage here at the store? Not just pocket money, but something you could save for your future. For the first time in a long while, I felt seen and appreciated. As I hugged my grandmother, I realized that maybe, just maybe, I could create my own opportunities. I didn't need to wait for someone else to invest in my future. With grandma's help, I could start investing in myself. As the years went by, I threw myself into my studies and my work at grandma's store. By the time I was 15, I'd managed to save up a decent amount. My goal? A laptop for school. One Friday afternoon, I decided to count my savings. I went to my closet and pulled out the pink ceramic piggy bank grandma had given me years ago. But when I shook it, something felt off. The familiar jingle of coins was missing. My heart racing, I opened the bottom and turned it over. Nothing. Not a single coin fell out. With shaking hands, I made my way downstairs. Tommy was sprawled on the couch, playing video games on a shiny new console. Hey, Tommy, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. You haven't seen my piggy bank, have you? Or the money inside it? He barely glanced up from his game. Nope, sorry. I took a deep breath and headed to the kitchen where mom was preparing dinner. Mom, I began, did you take the money from my piggy bank? She turned to me, her face calm. Oh, that, yes, I did. Tommy needed a new game console. His old one broke, and he was so upset. I knew you had some savings, so I took it. I stood there, speechless. Tears were threatening to spill, but I refused to let them fall. When will you pay me back? I managed to ask. Mom sighed as if I was being unreasonable. We'll see. Times are tight right now with all of Tommy's expenses. You understand, don't you? This is an investment in his future. I didn't understand. I couldn't understand how she could do this to me. Without another word, I turned and ran out of the house. I kept running until I reached Grandma's store, tears blurring my vision. Grandma took one look at me and flipped the open sign to closed. She led me to the back room and sat me down. What happened, Kimberly? She asked gently. Between sobs, I told her everything. As I spoke, I watched Grandma's face change from concern to disbelief to anger. What am I going to do, Grandma? I asked, feeling more lost than ever. I can't trust them. 
Grandma was quiet for a moment. Then she stood up. Wait here, she said. She disappeared into the front of the store. When she came back, she was carrying a laptop box. I was saving this for your birthday, she said, placing the box in my lap. But I think you need it now. Just don't take this home. Keep it here at the store. Use it after your shifts or on weekends. I don't want your mother getting her hands on this too. That night, as I lay in bed, I made a promise to myself. I would never let anyone take advantage of me like that again. I would work harder, save more, and find a way out of this house where I felt like a stranger. My 16th birthday rolled around with little fanfare. Mom remembered the date this time, at least. She and Dad wished me a happy birthday over breakfast, Dad sliding a card across the table before rushing off to work. I invited a few close friends. We set up some folding tables in the backyard, strung up some lights, and had a pretty good time. I'd saved up from my job at Grandma's store to buy snacks and drinks. My best friend Rachel helped me decorate with balloons and streamers we got from the dollar store. As we sat around eating chips and laughing about school drama, I caught myself feeling genuinely happy. For a moment, I could forget about the family dynamics and just be a normal teenager celebrating her birthday. But reality has a way of creeping back in. When Tommy's 16th birthday came around two years later, it was an extravaganza. They rented out the fanciest restaurant in town, invited what seemed like half the city, and even hired a professional photographer. The cherry on top. A shiny new car parked outside with a big red bow. I stood off to the side during the party, watching Tommy beam as he accepted congratulations and gifts. Despite everything, I couldn't bring myself to resent him. This wasn't his fault. He was just living the life our parents, especially mom, had orchestrated for him. A few months later, I was thrilled to learn I'd been accepted to study economics at a college in the next state. Even better, I'd earned a partial scholarship. But as I soon discovered, partial was the operative word. The scholarship wouldn't cover all my expenses. With trepidation, I approached my parents one evening. Mom, Dad, I began, I got into State University for Economics. I have a scholarship, but I'll need some help with the rest of the tuition and living expenses. Dad looked up from his newspaper, a crease between his brows. That's great news about the scholarship, Kim, but you know money's tight right now with Tommy's music school fees. Mom jumped in. Kimberly, you're a smart girl. I'm sure you can figure something out. Maybe get a job. You've always been so independent. Defeated, I retreated to my room. As I sat on my bed, staring at the acceptance letter, my phone buzzed with a text. It was Grandma, asking how the conversation with my parents went. I called her back, my voice shaking as I recounted what had happened. Grandma listened quietly, then said, Kimberly, don't you worry. We'll figure this out together. True to her word, Grandma set up a college fund for me. Between that, my scholarship, and a part-time job. I picked up at a cafe near campus. I managed to make it work. You're going to do great things, Kimberly, Grandma said. I'm so proud of you. Those words carried me through the tough times in college when I was up late studying or pulling double shifts at the cafe. If I'd remember Grandma's faith in me, I would push through. I called Tommy occasionally, trying to keep our connection alive. He was at a prestigious music college, all expenses paid by our parents, of course. Despite the differences in our situations, it was nice to hear his voice and to know that at least one person in that house might be missing me. After four grueling years of balancing studies, work, and tight budgets, I finally graduated with my degree in economics. Armed with my hard-earned qualifications and a determination to succeed, I returned to my hometown. It wasn't long before I landed a job at a prestigious financial firm 
and found a small but comfortable apartment to rent. Life settled into a pleasant routine. Work was challenging but rewarding. In my free time, I started to build a life for myself outside of my family's shadow. I made new friends, took up hiking on weekends, and even started dating a bit. Then one rainy Tuesday evening, there was a knock at my door. I opened it to find my mother standing there, looking uncharacteristically disheveled. She stepped inside, wringing her hands. Kimberly, I need your help. Those words sent a chill down my spine. In all my years, I couldn't remember my mother ever asking for my help. What's wrong? I asked, leading her to the couch. She sat down heavily, her eyes brimming with tears. I'm sick, Kim, really sick. The doctors say I need treatment, but our insurance won't cover it all. My heart dropped. Despite everything, she was still my mother. How much do you need? $15,000, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. I know it's a lot, but I didn't know where else to turn. Your father and I, we spent everything on Tommy's education. We thought it would pay off by now, but... The next morning, we drove to the bank in silence. As we waited in line, Mom started talking, her voice low. You know Tommy's doing so well, she said. He's got offers from several big music groups. Once he signs, we'll be able to pay you back in no time. I nodded, only half listening. My mind was racing, thinking about how I'd manage the loan repayments on top of my rent and other expenses. After signing what felt like a mountain of paperwork, I transferred the $15,000 to my mother's account. As we left the bank, she hugged me tightly. A few days later, I was scrolling through my social media feed during my lunch break when I saw something that made my blood run cold. There was Tommy, my brother, posting selfies from the Swiss Alps. She called me every day, her voice a soothing bee to my frayed nerves. Don't you pay any mind to those fools, she'd say firmly. They don't know the half of what's been going on in that house all these years. A week after my mother's posts went viral, my phone rang with a number I hadn't seen in years, my father's. I've been seeing your mother's posts, he began, and I braced myself for the criticism. But then he surprised me. I want to hear your side of the story, the full story. So I told him everything. The years of feeling overlooked, the incident with my piggy bank, the struggles through college, and finally, the loan and the betrayal that led to the lawsuit. There was a long silence when I finished. Then, to my shock, my father's voice came back thick with emotion. I had no idea, he said quietly. Kimberly, I'm so sorry I failed you as a father. I followed your mother's lead for too long. I told myself I was providing for the family by working long hours. But the truth is I was running away from the problems at home. I should have been there for you. Tears were streaming down my face now. This was the most open, honest conversation I'd had with my father in, well, ever. I've got a lot to make up for, he said. I know that, but if you're willing, I'd like to try to be the father I should have been all along. As we continued to talk, I felt a weight lifting off my shoulders. For the first time in years, I felt like I had a parent in my corner. It wasn't going to fix everything overnight, but it was a start. After our heart-to-heart, -heart, Dad decided to take a closer look at the family finances, something he admitted he should have done years ago. He found that Mom had been secretly withdrawing money from their joint account for years, funneling it all into Tommy's career. But that wasn't the worst of it. She'd taken out multiple loans in both their names, all to fund Tommy's pursuits. They were drowning in debt, and Dad had been completely in the dark. The confrontation that followed was explosive. I wasn't there, but I heard about it from the neighbors. There was shouting, the sound of dishes shattering, and finally, the arrival of police cars. In the aftermath, Dad filed for divorce. The proceedings were messy, 
But in the end, Mom got half of everything, which went straight to paying off her mountain of debt. I maintained my distance from Mom, focusing on rebuilding my relationship with Dad and cherishing the unwavering support of Grandma. Life started to feel normal. Then, about a year after the divorce, Mom's triumphant posts started appearing on social media again. Tommy had graduated from his music college and landed a spot in a famous band. Her captions were full of I told you so's and thinly veiled jabs at Dad and me. Some people couldn't see the potential, she wrote, but a mother always knows. Who's laughing now? I made an effort to ignore it. I had recently paid a down payment on my own apartment, was doing well at work, and felt like I was finally on firm ground. Dad was also doing better than I had ever seen him, appearing happier and more at ease. However, life has a tendency of surprising you with unexpected turns. Tommy returned to Switzerland two years after his great break. Videos of him partying with his bandmates and glitzy photos of the Alps were all over his social media accounts. In an attempt to show his admirers his vocal range in the freezing air, he then made the decision to record himself singing at the summit of a mountain one frosty morning. It was a catastrophe. He had a bad cold that turned into a dangerous infection of the throat. The harm was done even with the greatest medical attention. Tommy was no longer able to sing. Mom was devastated by the news. Later, her neighbors informed me that they heard yelling and the noises of objects being tossed and shattered coming from her home. They discovered her in complete hysterics when they went to see how she was doing. She continued talking about missed opportunities and dashed hopes, and she didn't recognize anyone. They were forced to call for assistance. A mental health hospital accepted mom. According to the physicians, she had a major nervous breakdown that had been made worse by years of stress. Tommy, on the other hand, became depressed and resorted to drinking. We weren't sure whether he would survive for months, but with dad's and my help, he gradually began to improve. In a surprising turn of events, he became sober and applied to colleges to teach music. I can't sing anymore, he stated to me while drinking coffee, but maybe I can help other kids who love music do it right, you know, without all the pressure and crazy expectations. I was filled with pride for my little brother. I think that's a great idea, Tommy. I thought back on the turbulent voyage of the previous several years as I drove home that evening. I considered Tommy discovering a new route, Dad being at last free to pursue his own life, Mom being stuck at the institution, confined in a world she had created, and me. I had defended my position, stood up for what was right, and emerged from the experience stronger.